So this is the motion you should see when you run the script. Mainly you should be looking at what happens in the y direction of the center of mass because that's where the sinusoidal motion happens. In the other two directions, x and z, the reference is just fixed. You can change it, you can also simulate a sinusoid in, in z or x, but you have to modify the code. And we can see that at the beginning it's not tracking perfectly. Do you know why? Because after a while it starts tracking perfectly. And then it never loses <coughs> the, the reference. But in the beginning it doesn't. Any guess why? Maybe the initial condition in the control of the velocity is that. Yeah, exactly. Since it's a sinusoid. At the beginning, the velocity is, is non-zero. So the robot starts with a zero velocity, but the reference starts with a non-zero velocity, so it takes a while to, to get back on track. That's the only reason. If we started with the right velocity, it would track perfectly from, from the very beginning. We can take a look at the accelerations as we did last time for the manipulator. The acceleration plot is a bit more complicated because we have three values instead of two. We have the real acceleration, the blue, blue curve. We have the reference, which is uh, the red curve. And then we have this extra acceleration, which is the desired, which is the reference plus the, the PD feedback terms, okay? So after a while, the three are the same, but in the beginning, we can see that the, the reference is not the same as the desired because we have a, a tracking error in velocity, especially, which explains why it's different. But we can see that here, the desired and the real one are always the same which means that even if the center of mass task is a cost function and not a constraint, it is satisfied as if it was a constraint because it is feasible, okay? Let's see what happens if we start increasing the, the tracking, the, the frequency of the reference trajectory. So in the code, Here in the beginning, you have these parameters amp 2 pi f, which define the, the amplitude and the frequency of the reference uh, trajectory for the center of mass, line 28 and 29 of the script. So now the amplitude is set to 5 centimeters for the y direction and to 0 for the x and z directions and the frequency is set to 0 0.5 okay so let's try let's try to increase it i don't know at which point it will break so i will just guess 1.5 let's see okay that was already enough to make it break too much, maybe. Uh, let me try something a bit smaller so that it, it breaks, but not as bad as this. Let's try one. Okay, that seems about right. Okay, you see you have self-collision because, again, there is nothing in the optimization problem accounting for self-collision avoidance. So the robot can self-collide. So of course the tracking here was not as good as in the previous case. We can see that it takes longer to get on the reference trajectory and even when it is there, 
it is not exactly tracking the reference. We can see that there are some tracking errors here. You see them? And I mean, also for the Z direction, this is not big, it's just one centimeter, but there is a bit of tracking error. And if we go look at the, what happens at the acceleration level, we can zoom a bit here. So in the beginning, everything is fine. We have something very similar to before. So the real and the desired are the same. But then look here what happens. That the real and the desired are no longer the same. What does it mean? Couldn't hear. Yeah. There is probably some of the, sub of the limits of the problem, which could be the friction con constraint, for instance, that are preventing the, the controller <coughs> to achieve the acceleration that we ask for. So even if we have a cost function that is saying, I would like to, to achieve this acceleration for my center of mass, the solver cannot find a solution that achieves this acceleration. So it tries to achieve an acceleration that is as close as possible to the desired one, but it's not exactly the desired one, okay? So in particular, I think that uh, the guess of Marco was correct. What's going on here is that the friction con constraints are preventing the robot from achieving the, the acceleration that he would like to see at the center of mass. Why? Why, when you see a problem with the center of mass tracking, you can always relate that, that to the contact forces? Well, because the center of mass acceleration is just given by the sum of all the external forces, right? That's Newton's law. So gravity plus contact forces. F equal M times A. That's always valid even for a multi-body system. So if you, if you cannot achieve the acceleration that you want, it's because you cannot achieve the contact forces that you would like to, 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 to see to get this acceleration. So this must be a problem of, of contact forces. Well, I shouldn't say must, because it could also be a problem of, of geometry. So I may be able to generate the contact forces that give me the desired center of mass acceleration, but the geometry of my robot, especially assuming that I have fixed uh, contact with the ground, may prevent me from, from doing that. One case that is very simple to, to think of is if I want to push my center of mass up, well, I can always have contact forces that push me up because I just need to, to push my feet into the ground but I cannot get my center of mass higher than this without breaking my contacts. Because the only way to be is to, to detach a part of my body and to lift it, I cannot do that. So it can be either contact forces or it can be the geometry of the robot that is preventing a, a desired motion to, to happen. Okay. But in this case, since it's, it's a lateral motion, I think it's it's mainly due to the to the contact forces and not to the geometry. Okay, of course we could keep playing with this, and I encourage you to to keep playing with this um, at home. <laughs> but now I would go to the next script that we play a little bit with that one as well. Uh, so for this script, the code is a bit more complicated. It's exercise three, bifid balance with GUI. Because inside the script, you, you, don't only, you not only have the, the controller, you also have the, the graphical user interface, okay? 
so it's not so interesting to go and, and, and look at all the code here. Basically, it's, it's a very similar code to the one we, we saw before. The main difference is that here I also handle uh, breaking contacts and making contacts and, and moving the feet of the robot, which we didn't do before. Before we just had uh, static contacts with both feet. Here you can break and, and make contacts. And you have, of course, the, the graphical user interface. So if you wanna, of course, go in details of the of the code, you're welcome to do it. And you can also come and ask me question, but I won't explain the code in detail as I did for the previous exercise. So here you have the humanoid, and the idea is that with this exercise you can interact in, in real time with the controller to see how it reacts. Whereas before you had only a, a one simulation of eight seconds, you could specify the parameters uh, offline, run it, see the result, that was it. Here you can interact in real time. So to interact with the controller, you can use this graphical user interface. The first three sliders specify the center of mass reference position, <coughs> X, Y, Z. Then you have the right foot, X, Y, Z, the left foot, X, Y, Z, and then you have uh, four buttons. One is to break the contact with the right foot, the other to break the contact with the left foot. This one is to toggle the wireframe mode in the viewer, which means that you're going to see inside the robot. And this is useful because inside the robot you have some balls that represent the center of mass position, reference and real. And then you have the, 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 the funniest button, which is push robot CUM. And you have also three text boxes below it to specify the CUM velocity in the three directions. So here you're simulating a push to the robot by basically incrementing its center of mass velocity by a given delta. And you can specify the delta using the the text, uh, the text boxes. So you should be careful to insert only numbers inside these boxes because if you if you start adding something that is not a number, then probably you're gonna you're gonna break the script and you need to stop it and, and rerun it. So the first thing you can you can try is to move a bit the center of mass right and left and see how the controller reacts. If you move it enough to one side, for instance here I move the center of mass uh, 10 centimeters to the left of the robot, then I can break the, the contact with the right foot by clicking on this button. Of course when I do it nothing really happens, but if I could see the contact forces on the right foot, right now they, they would be zero, because I, I broke the contact. And now since I broke the contact, I can move the right foot, I can lift it. I can move it forward, like this. Okay, move it forward, tuck, tuck, tuck. then I move it back again. So it's, it's at zero, which means it's on the ground again. And now I can re-click on the same button to reactivate the contact with the right foot. So make contact right foot. Now I have the contact, which means that now I can move my center of mass forward and rightward to go on the right foot. Of course, it's, it's really boring to generate a walking motion in this way by moving by hands, center of mass and feet and making and breaking contact, but that's basically how you could imagine that uh, another controller, more high level, could use this controller to generate 
uh, a, a walking trajectory, a walking motion. And that's actually exactly what we're gonna do starting from today after the break. We're gonna start looking at how we can specify, we can use optimal control <coughs> to generate walking motion on top of uh, TSID, so task space inverse dynamics control. I already showed you last time, but I really love it, so I'm gonna show it to you again. The, the push behavior. I specify some some center of mass velocity. Here I specified 10 centimeters per second in X and zero in Y and Z. And when I click push, the robot gets pushed forward. Of course, 10 centimeters is small, let's go 20. And you can keep going until you make it work. And you can see that at a certain point, the robot starts rotating its arms because it starts using angular momentum to try to, to accelerate the center of mass backwards, but eventually it fails. And all of this emerges basically naturally. I'm not specifying please rotate the arms to accelerate your center of mass backward is just that the dynamics equation of the system contains the information inside them and so the solver is able to generate these movements naturally okay so i think that's all i wanted to show you for now so we could take a 10 minute break and then we start talking about uh, trajectory optimization after the break. Unless you have some question? No. Okay. Take a break.